So this month, as you know, we are lifting up courageous and contagious generosity. We're in the midst of our stewardship appeal, and we are preparing ourselves spiritually through video testimonies and that Sunday school class and a short sermon series and a prayer service to consider the question of our giving from a spiritual angle. Because it's really not about the money, friends. It's about how we trust and serve God and how we find the courage to serve God faithfully. So the next three sermons, that's this week, next week, and the 28th, will challenge us to think about our giving in the following ways. This week is divest, next week is invest, and the 28th will be be blessed. Pastors like to rhyme. So this morning's scripture is a familiar story to many of us. It comes in three parts, and we're going to read them one at a time. In the first part, we find Jesus still traveling along the road to Jerusalem, but delayed for the moment by a man who has a significant question to ask. I want you to listen for that question, because it is one that many of us might like to ask Jesus if we could, a question that, if we were sure of the answer, might even change the way we live. Now, we know this passage, some of us, as the story of the rich young ruler, but Mark's gospel doesn't specify his age or his income bracket or his social standing. Mark just calls him a man, any man, every man, somebody just like us. So I want to invite you to try to put yourself in this every man's shoes Listen for his question and Jesus' answer as if it were intended for you. You ready? I begin with Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing, go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. I wish I could see Jesus' facial expression as he has this conversation with this man. Mark, Mark says that Jesus loved him. Now, whether they had ever met before this incident or not, we don't know, but Jesus approached him with compassion, with love, and I think with an eye toward discerning the man's true feelings and desires. Good teacher, the man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's one of those impossible questions, right? Like your children ask you right at bedtime on a school night. <laughs> Jesus looks at him closely, as if to check the man's motivation. Why do you call me good? Because no one is good except God alone. But the man remains on his knees at Jesus' feet. Apparently, he really wants to know the answer. So Jesus continues, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. The man looks up and says to him earnestly, but teacher, I have kept these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him, Mark says. Jesus wants this son of Abraham to have the truth. And so he says, you lack one thing. 
And here, for a moment, the man's heart is receptive and his ears are burning only one thing he lacks? Then he is on the right track. Then his obedience has paid off. He is about to hear the final word of wisdom, the one more thing he needs in his portfolio. Maybe an extra visit to the temple in Jerusalem. Maybe a gift for the priests. Maybe commissioning a special version of the Torah. Maybe accepting a position of leadership on the temple board. Maybe making a significant public sacrifice. How many bulls, Lord? How many rams? I can do it. I can afford it. I want to make you proud. He is prepared for whatever the master requires. But what the master tells him is not what he expects. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. The man stares at Jesus in disbelief, unable to comprehend what he has just heard. Sell all his possessions? Give it all away? Well, that doesn't even make sense. How can he honor God if he has no wealth, no power, no influence to use? The man had expected the teacher's response to be more congratulatory. <laughs> he thought Jesus might even be impressed, not only with his obedience to the commandments, all those sinful things he had not done, but maybe with his assets and his influence the great rewards of the awesome things he had done. But Jesus is not impressed. He's impelled. He looks past the young man's pride and accomplishments and right toward his heart, where his true self lies. But the young man's heart is obscured by pride, by accomplishment, by self-authentication. He only knows how to please God through status and success. I imagine Jesus communicating to him with his eyes, just set all those trophies down, son. You don't need them. In fact, they get in your way when you hold them close. The reward you seek is found in letting go. When he heard this, verse 22, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. The young man doesn't understand. And, and how can you blame him? The one thing he lacks is lack? <laughs> the one thing he has to hold on to is how to let go? Now remember I asked you to try to put yourself in this man's shoes. So how's this story making you feel right now? Would you too be shocked and grieving if Jesus told you to sell everything you have and give it all away? Maybe all of us are looking for a bit of an out. Jesus couldn't have really meant that, not for all of us. I mean, surely this is metaphor. Exaggeration, right? Like two weeks ago when he was talking about cutting off hands and plucking out eyes. Maybe this guy needed to give it all away. Maybe he was a scoundrel, a miser, maybe even an embezzler. He needed to repent from his ill-gotten gain, but, well, that's not my story. I'm honest. I'm law-abiding. I'm not even rich. I don't think Jesus really meant those words for me. But friends, we got to be careful about saying Jesus' words don't apply to me, because most of the time they do. What if Jesus did mean you and me and every single person in this room today? What if this story isn't about one man who was dishonest or greedy, but about all of us who suffer from attachment to our possessions? I think Jesus knows what's in all of our hearts when it comes to our things, how our consumer culture affects us, makes us crazy. I think he's hoping to offer us a way to cut loose from whatever weighs us down. After all, if Jesus loved this man who interrupted his journey, he surely loves us too. 
and longs to help us be free. I suspect that Jesus' words are spoken here not to condemn or judge us for what we have, but to set us free from what hinders us so we might enter the kingdom unencumbered. The second part of the reading begins on verse 23. So Jesus looked around and said to all his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at his words. But Jesus said to them, again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. So I did a little research on this camel through the eye of the needle image that Jesus talks about here because I had always heard, like some of you may have heard, that the needle was the name of a small gate, a door in the stone city wall that went all around the town. It was the only entrance into the city after dark. Daytime, there was a great big huge gate that could swing open to welcome carts and camels and caravans and entire entourages of people coming in to do trade. But at sunset, the tall doors would be bolted shut and there would only be one side door, so to speak, for nighttime travelers to enter, one person at a time. The door was not intended for camels. <laughs> for a camel to enter through the needle gate, it would have to drop down to its knees and be divested of all its saddlebags and cargo and still it would be a great struggle. A camel would, in other words, have to leave its earthly goods behind and enter through the gate humbly and on its knees. You get the metaphor? <laughs> you like it? I like it. I think it's cool. Something about it rings true. But while it may be spiritually true, it may not be factually true. Nobody has ever been able to find any archaeological evidence of the needle gate in Israel or any documentation suggesting that it really happened that way. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but no one can prove it did. So there's this alternate explanation, a, a linguistic interpretation that suggests that the Aramaic word for camel is very similar to the Aramaic word for cable. Okay, not in English, but in Aramaic. And that Mark maybe just heard it wrong, wrote down the wrong word. So maybe the needle is actually a needle, but the camel is a cable or a, a rope that needs to be threaded through some kind of small opening. Well, the image then might be getting a rope through the eye of some kind of needle. It still requires some kind of paring down, right? some kind of divesting or thinning or taking something down to its barest essential thread before it can pass through the opening. Honestly, I don't know if either of these explanations are factually true or whether Jesus maybe literally meant that it's easier for a literal camel to pass through the eye of a literal needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. But either way, his message seems clear, doesn't it? We cannot enter the realm of the beloved community where the hungry are fed and the poor are lifted up and the dead are raised if everybody's trying to hold on to all their stuff and lug it with them through the door when they come. The kingdom of heaven represents a divestment from the kingdoms of this world, an abandonment of worldly values. I'm not sure you can live in both worlds at the same time because you can't receive what God wants to give you if your hands are already full of your own stuff. But the church can help us prioritize, can help us divest. In a couple of weeks, we will have the opportunity to make a financial commitment toward the missions and ministries of this congregation for the coming year. And I'll tell you, it sounds strange, but this season is always really exciting to me. 
It's really hopeful because it's an opportunity for the whole church to recommit ourselves and our resources towards something we really care about, something God really cares about, putting our resources to work to support the kingdom is a spiritual commitment more than a financial one. And I think it feels really good. I think it feels a lot better than the other way around when our possessions put us to work for them. You know what I mean? Think for just a moment about how much of your family's budget, time, energy, and worry goes to support and protect the things you own like your home, your car, your clothes, even your hobbies. Okay, there's nothing wrong with having a home and a car and clothes and hobbies. I'm just saying, think for a moment about everything you have to do and pay in order to finance, clean, store, maintain, relocate, upgrade, guard, and ensure things. Those inanimate objects that you purchased once with your money, but which you are still paying for in one way or another every month and every year. Perhaps you've heard the saying, the things you think you own really own you. Sometimes it feels that way. But it can feel amazingly freeing when you lighten that load a little bit, when you divest from some of what weighs you down. I know this from personal experience because I just moved. <laughs> we just moved our household from one house to another, one town to another, and between sending a whole truckload of stuff up here for the rummage sale and donating a whole bunch of stuff to Goodwill and giving away things to friends, including the contents of the china cabinet that we no longer have because it used to sit in the dining room that we no longer have, <laughs> it feels really great. I actually don't miss any of the stuff we gave away. I don't even miss the stuff that we didn't intend to get rid of. I don't know if you heard me tell this story before, but on the morning of the move, 4 or 5 a.m., there was this huge thunderstorm in Chatham, which knocked out the electricity, which knocked out the sump pump, which sent sort of this flood of water across our basement floor where we had all these boxes packed and stacked and ready to go. And we flew into a panic, carrying the boxes upstairs and trying to pull them back from the encroaching water, but we could not keep up. There was nothing to be done. The bottom layer of boxes just got wetter and wetter and was soaked. The movers were coming in an hour, <laughs> and we had no time to come up with some kind of a strategy. So I just, for myself, said, never mind, let it go. Most of the bottom layer of boxes is my books. I can do without them. It's going to be okay. And you know what? It is all okay. <laughs> I don't even miss the books that I lost. In fact, I'm not even sure I have identified yet which ones they were. You go in my office right now, it is obvious that I have plenty of books. I don't need any more books than the ones I have. I guess it was just time to let them go. Now, it doesn't always come that easy, of course. Peter. Poor Peter, in today's reading, is really struggling with letting go. He is still thinking about what he's left behind. And he's kind of hoping that he gets extra points for the sacrifice. I'm picking up at verse 28. Peter began to say to Jesus, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold, now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So I'll confess it is odd to me that Jesus promises Peter a hundredfold of houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields as a reward for having given them up. 
Perhaps he meant to suggest that if we shed all our earthly belongings before we enter through the needle gate, there will be that much and more waiting for us on the other side. Houses, fields, family, everything we need in paradise. But if you remember in the scripture, Jesus is talking about this age, not the next. And if the point is really divestment, emptying, unloading those things that tempt us or even own us, then what good would that be to load them all back up again? I've been thinking about this, and I wonder whether this divestment at the gate metaphor could describe the transition of our lives from before we join a church to our lives in the faith community. See, if we come to the gates of the church and we hope to come inside, but we cannot let go of our time, talent, and treasure, of what we think of as our own assets, as if we have anything without the abundant generosity of God, then we still in some ways remain outside the gate, handbag and backpack and briefcase bulging and full and unable to fit through the door, fists too full of our own accomplishments to receive the hand of welcome, schedules and to-do lists already full to the top, no room for prayer or Bible study, Budgets already strapped with nothing left to contribute. Our lives are already full to the brim and we get stuck on the outside of the door, missing the celebration that's going on inside. But if we can divest ourselves of ourselves, give our stuff away and walk freely and unencumbered through the gate of the church, we may find a whole new life waiting for us inside. Jesus, remember, promises homes, fields, and family. Well, indeed, here we find a church home, a mission field, a family of faith. He invites us into a life together that is better, richer, more impactful than anything we could have done on our own. That's how I'm reading the passage today. And incidentally, that's how the early church began. Acts chapter 2 tells how the followers of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, sold their belongings, provided for the poor, had all things in common, left nobody out. That would take a lot of courage, wouldn't it? To give up your goods, divest yourself of everything you thought you'd owned or earned, and trust God to provide for the whole community. What would that look like if somebody today did that? Well, when I was in seminary at Garrett Evangelical, I met a man who did just that. His name was Bud Ogle, and he had been a Presbyterian minister on the Northwestern Illinois campus in Evanston during the 1970s. One evening, he told me he was sitting around with some of his college students, and they were studying the Gospels, this Gospel, actually, this very story where Jesus says that those who want to follow him should sell everything and give it all away and come with him to the places he was called to go. And somebody in his group said, well, if that's what Jesus really told us to do, why aren't we doing it? And they stayed up late that night going round and around with the scripture, trying to find a way out. <laughs> trying to find a way to read it that didn't call for such a dramatic response, but nobody could find a way around the call. So Bud took a leap of faith and answered the call. He sold all his earthly goods, and he invested it in a housing project in the North Howard neighborhood of Rogers Park, which is an area particularly plagued with crime and poverty, prostitution, homelessness, and drugs. He and his students pooled their resources, they bought an old abandoned hotel, and one by one they refurbished all the rooms to create adequate housing. In 1980, they became an official 501c3. They called themselves Good News Partners, with a governing board and connections to partner churches. And since that time, they've been working to get people off the streets, off drugs, and into their own homes. They own 10 buildings now, which provide safe housing for over 550 people, and that includes a lot of children. There are some amazing, inspiring stories come out of Good News Partners Ministry. 
as the lives of residents are literally saved and turned around. But get this, the lives of the partners, the church members and the volunteers and, and those who give of themselves to support the project, they're transformed too. But nobody's life has been transformed as much as Bud's has been. I know this because I've seen it. When I was doing children's ministry in Evanston, I used to bring carloads of kids down from our church down into the Rogers Park area to spend the day with the Good News Partners kids. And I would watch Bud's face as the kids all played together across racial and socioeconomic boundaries played on the playground, shared their snacks, and sang songs about the Jesus who loved all of them. He had a kind of joy on his face on those days that I wonder if he ever experienced as a North Shore campus preacher. Now, I don't remember all the details of those mornings we spent at Good News Partners, but I will never forget the story Bud told me and the look in his eyes as he shared about how he and his students had divested themselves of the resources God had loaned them and followed Jesus into the mission field. It wasn't an easy call to answer, and I know they still face struggles, financial and otherwise, but I have no doubt that Bud wouldn't have had it any other way, that he wouldn't have traded the freedom of letting go and the joy of following Jesus for a million dollars. Friends, it all comes back to that original question that I ask you about at the beginning of the sermon. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Every man wants to know, right? We all want to know. What is expected of me? What must I accomplish? What must I sacrifice in order to live in God's kingdom? And Jesus' answer is amazingly simple. Nothing. You don't have to do anything. I've done the work. I've made the sacrifice. Now all I want you to do is set your stuff down and come to me with open hands so I can give you the gift. Would you pray with me? God, the story of Today's man challenges our hearts and our spirits. It challenges our receiving and our giving. Speak to us through this lesson, this gospel which we know as good news, and help us to be ready, open, and waiting to receive the good news of salvation that you give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you...